Hello everybody, I'm Dan Merle. You know, one of the things that people have asked me about the most over the last several weeks is Star Trek Picard Season 3, which just wrapped up a little over two weeks ago. And I've talked about Star Trek Picard here on the channel before. I did video reviews of the first two seasons, and they weren't exactly my cup of Earl Grey. And I think, as I mentioned at the end of my Season 2 review, I wasn't quite sure where I stood with Season 3, if I was going to watch it. Shortly after I posted that video, I had a friend reach out who said, hey, you know, just so you know, with Season 3, Terry Metalis, who I actually did mention in my Season 2 review, is taking the reins as the showrunner and he's a big Trek guy and you know I think that there's a chance that you may enjoy season three even if you weren't the biggest fan of the first two seasons. So kind of based on that recommendation and some of the buzz around that season I decided to give Star Trek Picard season three a shot and boy am I glad I did because I absolutely loved this third season. It delivered so many things as a fan of Star Trek, specifically Star Trek The Next Generation, but also all iterations of Star Trek. There were things in this season that I never thought that I would see. Closure uh, with plot points, closure emotionally. We are about to do a deep dive with Terry Metalis, the showrunner on Star Trek Picard Season 3. And as the title states, this is a spoiler chat. We are going to go deep, very deep, strangely nerdy Star Trek deep into some of the major plot points and storylines of Star Trek Picard Season 3. So if you haven't seen that season yet, first of all, if you're a Star Trek fan, do yourself a favor and go watch it. It is really, really special. It's something that I enjoyed a lot, and we're going to get into a lot of the reasons why I really loved it. If you have seen Star Trek Picard Season 3, then get ready for some great info. We had a really, really fun chat. And don't worry, I will also be doing a video review for Star Trek Picard Season 3 here on the channel. But as you know, I work on those things very, very slowly. And I have a lot to break down in a good way with this third season. So stay tuned in the future because I am still going to be doing one of those. But for now, let's go to my chat with Star Trek Picard Season 3 showrunner, Terry Metalis. You should know that I now prefer pacifism to actual combat. Energize, or I'm gonna die. Terry Metalis, thank you for joining us. Uh, some people I think might be surprised to see you here on the channel, but you know, at this season, and, and I'm not the only one uh, that has said this, is, you know, like just not even talking about the other seasons of the show, this season was so special to so many Star Trek fans. What was your overriding kind of driving principle when you got the chance to do this third season of the show? Well, we were filming them back to back. I mean, that that's one of the, the key things to remember is, uh, in fact, season two didn't even air until after we had completed shooting season three you know we were, i was literally going down to set during season two and talking with uh you know the actors uh about certain things like with jerry and michelle and patrick holistically it did feel like this was going to this was going to be different and the north star to patrick and to the studio was could this be the undiscovered country for star trek the next generation could this be their send-off um and everyone was really excited by that idea. Certainly I was, because it, it felt like um, they never had that. That after Nemesis, it felt like there was going to be one more film. It, that didn't really feel like the conclusion. Even sort of data transferring his stuff over to B4 felt like a bit of a kind of cliffhanger. There was some send-off ideas with Riker going to the Titan and but it didn't feel as conclusive maybe um, um, as I think we all wanted it to feel. I would never call Picard season three uh, next gen season eight. Some fans do, but I don't, I don't really feel it. I just, I just had an amazing meeting with, with somebody who did call it that. I, I, to me, it feels more like Star Trek 11, right? It feels more like a Star Trek movie. Because you're really picking up those threads and that feeling, that more of a cinematic kind of, those cinematic story threads. It does. It, if you were going to do season eight, it would be a different kind of storytelling. It would be more of an intellectual, uh, not less serialized um, of the week. Well, I mean, you know, next gen season eight. I mean, that almost feels like a continuation 
or would be a continuation basically of where you were. And one of the things that I like so much about the season was there was so much lived life unwrapping. Like, you know, you have Beverly. She's now kind of this Doctors Without Borders. You're catching up on these decades of, of things that have happened with these characters. Like when you're breaking the story for that, do you just kind of break everybody out individually and then figure out, okay, how are we going to loop this into the overall season? No, a lot of that starts to come organically as part of the big picture. So when, um, so in that case, we started with, when I sat down with Patrick, I, I said it, it felt like for the final story, we wanted to tell the story of a father and a son. We kind of, he had already done a father and a daughter kind of with Soji in season one. If we were going to do a son, where would that come from? Mirror Universe, Bash, all those ideas. And we started to go through it and he was dismissing a bunch. We certainly had this back pocket idea about Beverly Crusher, but we weren't going to pitch it to Patrick because we never thought Patrick would go for it. And, but we would at the end of the conversation. And then Patrick said, what if it was Beverly? He, he, he thought it was a phenomenal idea. So then you have to go away and figure out, all right, the Beverly Crusher we know in Star Trek Next Generation, how does that make sense? Why would she keep a child from Patrick or from Picard? And that's very, that it doesn't really line up. But if you start to go back to her relationship with Wesley, some of the math starts to work out a little bit. And then you say, look, we have almost 20 years now to say she's a different person, went off in a different way. I lost my parents, then a husband, then my son, Wesley, all to the same stars that own you. Then you sit down with Gates, and she's like, you know, I don't want to be the same Beverly Crusher. I've changed as a human. And here's how I've changed. Um, and I have a, a son. So you start to build all that stuff together. And so what you have is Doctors Without Borders on the frontier with a weird doesn't make sense shotgun phaser thing defending her, uh, her ship uh, and her son. Um, and um, uh, that's how that... So that becomes that character. As a mother, your whole being is about protecting your child. I, th I thought I could protect mine. I didn't know if I could protect yours. When you're bringing in something like Captain Picard's son, um, you know, when you're talking to Ed, who plays Jack, on the show in context of the whole season it works out great but was there ever this worry of like you know uh almost like a mutt williams effect like is the oh my are God, the fans yes. gonna hey, are they gonna williams, accept mutt. this <laughs> every minute mutt williams was was because you know there are moments in that movie you know it's that's so funny you brought that up there's a moment where in in um crystal skull there's a great transition uh, before you meet Mutt, where there's a line, um, uh, I think, I, I, I forget who it is. is it Jim Broadbent says to Indy, seem to have reached the age where life stops giving us things and starts taking them away. And then it cuts to Indy on the train and then his son shows up. And it's kind of a, kind of a brilliant, classic Spielberg transition, right? And then what happens, happens. So yes, you have that, that pressure. Um, um, and, and look, there's there's certainly a, a, a subsect of fans who will tell you that he's totally Mutt Williams. Um, but I think predominantly, I feel like uh, we won the crowd with Jack. Uh, so, um, but every day, those things hang <laughs> over hang over you. It, um, is is how how can you get the audience to connect to somebody quickly? So if you think that this is about a moment that I need. I think maybe I do. Captain Shaw. Yeah. The fans love him. Yeah. It's Todd Stashwick, a new Star Trek fan favorite. Um, yeah. The, I mean, the, I mean, the first, from the first scene, he's just, like a, a fascinating character because you don't quite know what's going on with him. I like structure. I like meter. I like keeping tempo and time, which is why you will probably find this inspection boring for the likes of you two. But I think it it all really kind of leads up to that scene in the holodeck. And it's one of my favorite Star Trek scenes 
recently where he goes into the Battle of Wolf, Wolf 359. Do you know where your old man was on that day? He was on that Borg cube setting the world on fire. And what I love about it is it's not just him being angry at Picard. You get into like survivor's guilt. And it's mm -hmm. like it's this right. internal anger and guilt, external anger and guilt. And that's such a well acted monologue. Well, Todd's he's one of my best friends. So we uh, early I mean, we wrote it for Todd. So um, Chris Monfett, Sean Tretta uh, were, were two of the loudest uh, 12 Monkeys voices. And my last show called 12 Monkeys and Todd was one of the lead characters in that. And um, early on, when, right from the first episode, we started breaking it. We had this this character, and um, I said I loved the idea of them coming on and being this captain who did not revere these legends. Or and I was like, he's a dick. He's, I said he's Captain Stashwick, is what I said. And so that that was the part of them. We we called Todd and we we're like, we're writing this case. Well, well, he's like, I can't wait to see who you really get for it. We're like, it's it's going to be you, man. For Franks, he's directing episodes three and four at the same time because we blocked you. Mm -hmm. So, and he's doing the most amount of performance. He's he's a machine. He never gets tired. He comes on with the best energy, and he asked all the right questions um, in prep for it. He, um, fortunately, it was in the beginning of the season, so he had the most time probably. And Ed, Patrick, and Todd, the they all get along so well. So that's such a warm room for those three actors to, to play in. Um, so it could not have been a better theater process uh, for, for everyone. Um, and, and for the rest of, for the writers, uh, it was us trying to find the best version of that monologue. We all took a pass at versions of that monologue uh, um, Sean was the one who, who, who sort of found um, this this uh, this this version of survivor's guilt. Why, why me? I'm just some dipshit from Chicago. There's all the all these little different things we all added to it, um, um, but we're all really, really, really proud of it. it was such a such a collaborative effort with all of us. Well, and the end of that episode has, you know, it's, it, it, I was, I mean, I was digging the season throughout, but we get to the end of episode four. It has, I call it the encounter at far point moment. It's this moment of taking in the wonder of space and like Riker kind of has this rebirth in that moment yeah. where he sort of rediscovers life. And that's just, it's to me, that was very foundationally Star Trek. It's the idea of going into a quote alien atmosphere and you find yourself and you find the wonder of, you know, like, like being human in, in a weird way. Every Star Trek series has a different tone and a different feel. But that to me felt so much more like this is the core of what Star Trek is about. Um, yeah, I think everybody uh, understood. And uh, that was an early I mean, again, that was actually part of the initial pitch I had, even to Patrick in and um into Akiva and Alex early on into the studio. Um, the, 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 the reason for it was, it was a four episode arc. Uh, it was, a, it was a movie essentially that was going to take you through a lot of struggle, but end with this catharsis, this sense of wonder, this classic Star Trek sense of wonder. And the shot of them, um, bathed in that blue light looking at the space babies was a shot I had, I, I had, and I knew I would have Stephen Barton, the score up. I like, I just, I knew that was, I had that in my head as the end of that, that of the act one arc. Um, and I knew that we could write it quickly because we were behind um, and I needed to feed production pages. <laughs> um, so it was a very easy pitch because you were taking discovery of, uh, it was a story about a new family too. Uh, I mean, that's a new family being born and the discovery of Picard coming to accept that he did have a son 
It's, it was also uh, the son coming to accept he had a father. And then Riker, who had been running away from this darkness of losing his son, experiencing all of it, witnessing this reunion, um, and then seeing this, and then feeling that catharsis and then reaching back out to Deanna. It, it all felt like a perfect little Star Trek movie um, as a perfect act one. Um, uh, yeah, it was, a, it, it was a pretty um, easy pitch, I think, um, for us. Uh, uh, and something we could, I mean, I think we wrote all those, those four, we had to write those very, very fast because we didn't have any time television that's that's the thing that's another thing that people don't really understand and, and like even like reading about the, the heyday of tng and any any show you're just you're furiously laying down the tracks in front of the train and even with a yeah. show like this which isn't on the same kind of production cycle as the network shows used to be like like you say you're, you just have to feed scripts to the you know is how do you have perspective on any of it or do you not do you just kind of say like i'm doing the best that i can do and we're, we're i think it's working yeah we're you know, it, you know? I, 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 it's funny I, at the end of the season i i gave an interview about things we would love to have had if we had more time and money and and then um and then even some some fans were like oh he's blaming time and money i'm like you guys like <laughs> you just want to put your fist through a screen it's like you don't understand you're up till two o'clock in the morning. You're not even having dinner until two 30 and you got to be up at six 30 to be on set, trying to make all the things work, trying to, it, it's not uh, palm trees and swimming pools all day long and piles of money. It's really, it, it is um, such an arduous process um, to get in these rooms. Um, so many demands, um, you don't get to just decide what to do um, as a showrunner. It's not, it doesn't all come down to you. You, you have a studio, a network, host of producers, a franchise department, and then 12 actors, and then uh, a writing staff, all of which have very important opinions in many different demographics that, to listen to. And then you write it and then Everyone with with the paycheck says you cannot do that. So here's what here is the menu of what you can do. You're, so you're going to rewrite this in twelve hours so that we can shoot it. And so that's that's just life in the big city. That's, that's how entertainment. <laughs> that's, how <it> <laughs> that's TV. If you want to get it made and not get fired and 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 shut everybody down because if you don't do it, that's the other thing. If you don't do it. Production doesn't have anything to shoot. And then this entire company has to shut down and is out of work in a time of COVID. So it, yeah. it, it, it is, um, it is a lot of, it is a lot of, a lot of pressure. Come on, bro. You know us. For these proceedings, you will address me as commander. Ensign Roe. Well, not Ensign anymore, but Roe. Right. Uh, right. Roe Laren, Roe Laren coming back. What I loved again, and, and it's not just her, it's so many things about the franchise. Like there have been so many other things things revivals legacy sequel whatever you want to call it they bring back a character just to bring him back and it's empty and it's just like oh that there's that person i know with ro and again when i'm watching the episode i was just like oh my god this is so incredible you stop and you have that conversation between her and picard about you betrayed me i mentored you you broke my heart and her saying like well you all all you saw in me was what you wanted me to be i believed in you only when it was easy for you if I meant so much, you would have understood. As a TNG fan, I was sitting there eating it up with just, you know, like, this is incredible. Like, this is the conversation I never thought I would see. Is there ever any question, um, you know, from all of the, that panel of people you just described of people saying like, well, wait a minute. I mean, yes. if they don't know TNG, they're not going to get this scene. Yes. Like, is there yes. ever any pushback on that? Yes. Oh, yes. There, you want to, we just spent all this money bringing back Star Trek Next Generation. Now you want to bring back another character. <laughs> Who is this character? Why is this character important? Um, uh, and so we have to go before the panel and, and plead our case that, it, that this is the last opportunity that we'll ever see this character again, probably. Does Michelle want to do and have those conversations with Michelle? 
does she feel strongly about this story, this character? Patrick, did they, did they feel, does Patrick feel strongly about it? And then can we, can we do it well? And, you know, Cindy Appel wrote those, wrote the Rolaren story, wrote that, that entire thing. I, I really, I, obviously it's such a, the way that story ends in Next Gen is such a heartbreaker. Could you tell Captain Picard something for me? Of course, what is it? Tell him I'm sorry. I was always shocked that she never came back in one of the films. She's such a, I mean, Michelle Forbes is just one of the greatest actresses of all time. To not have her back always felt like, why wouldn't you? But if you were doing a story about paranoia thriller, about you weren't sure if the person sitting across from you was really that person, wouldn't it be amazing to do a catharsis? Like you had to get through your issues at the same time. But And um, Cindy just wrote that brilliantly. And and, um, and, and she deserves all, all the credit for those killer scenes in the, in the bar and, and telling that whole arc. Um, yeah, I'm really proud of what she pulled off. You have a running joke throughout the season that nobody really seems to enjoy Chateau Picard. <laughs> Chateau Picard? That is, that is terrific. I'm much more of a mallback man myself. You brought a gift to my anniversary dinner on Rigel. A Chateau Picard Bordeaux, which you said was too dry because your taste in wine is pedestrian at best. Is it is it true that uh, the characters just have very pedestrian taste in wine? Or do you think personally that it might be possible that uh, Admiral Picard is perhaps not the great winemaker that he believes himself to be? I will, I will leave that up to the audience to decide. <laughs> uh, if you know there I, i've seen theories online that maybe uh it it proves that it's not his first best destiny um <laughs> or um you know maybe they're not they they don't have the best taste in wine so but we <laughs> that's funny i love that that gag played <laughs> we, we were wondering if people were going to pick up on it but we're i'm glad they did that's for sure sour mead Chateau Picard. It is quite tart, sir. The movies, are, you have when you take an ensemble TV cast, you put them in a movie. It's just how it happens. You have 100 minutes, maybe 120. Not yeah. everybody gets a chance to, to get the spotlight. Yeah. This, this season, everybody got a chance to take the spotlight. And so one of my favorite things, Data and Jordy, that scene with LeVar where he gets to tell Data what his death did to him. Like, again, as someone watching the show that watched seven seasons of Data and Jordy being best friends, it's like, I, it took this long for someone to actually acknowledge that or to write a scene like that. When you die, you broke me. I, I imagine for them, it's gratifying that they get to kind of return to this dynamic that you didn't get much of. A little bit in generations, but beyond that, you didn't get much of that in the movies. No, I'm absolutely. I mean, they they definitely felt that way. I mean, you know, Brent was Lavar's best man at his wedding. Uh, you know, I mean, they're apps. They for sure feel that way. Jordy has changed so much to see Lavar do these scenes. We wrote them, um, and we were not prepared for what Lavar brought to them. And we're watching them on set, going. We don't think the fans are going to be ready for these scenes. There's, there's, he's so good. Um, uh, yeah, we were, I mean, boy, talk about blessed. I mean, that was the, the, that, and they each actor brought all the right ideas to those scripts, all the right, um, performances and, and everything. And, um, yeah, being there in those moments, watching that on the monitor, we knew we had something special. I hope that you can sense as fully as any human has ever felt anything, how happy I am to have my friend back. Another thing that I feel like, because it's sort of like the Leonard Nimoy thing with Spock. Because Brent Spiner played a character who didn't have emotion, I think people underrated his acting ability. Right. And that's actually a very difficult character to play here in this season, I mean, you got one episode where he's playing Data, Lore, oh, B4, yeah. 
this new version of data also alton so i mean he's playing all these different characters but that sh that final showdown again to take time to to close this loop that final showdown between data and lore one of my favorite things that you did this season he was showered with all the love and friendship the galaxy could offer what a waste when you're looking at these things from the series that you're revisiting ro data and lore was there a, did you have a personal list of you're like, I want to tie these things up or was it you're, when you're breaking the story in the room, you're like, you see an opportunity to do these things that are so gratifying for people. Uh, no, we didn't have a list. Um, again, that was coming to it or organically. Um, but I, I sat with Brent and said, we have to, data has to play a part in this. He died twice. How are we getting to the data we were promised? Um, which is the more human, the end game data that we kind of right. thought we were headed towards uh, in generations with emotion and whatnot. But how do you get there in a new, interesting way? And um, I had pitched, well, what if there is, pitched to Brent, what if there is a data unit with all of these personalities in there? B4 had been uploaded. Lore had been archived, all these things. And, and, and that, that Soong's last project was trying to actually achieve this goal and then died before it was finished. Yeah. Um, and he was like, okay, that I like. Um, <laughs> and that, um, and we had toyed with even giving him like, like a different name, but we both were like, we wanted him to be David. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and, and, and so even, even Brent at the end is like, he's data. Because they said data had is the master program of it all, and and, and was the one who would collate all these the new information to to be to be what he wanted to be. Um, so that's how we came to it. That's that's how we 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 organized it. And then um, the the lore pieces, those those sort of Easter egg things, were built from there. But this may. This me would rather be no place else in the universe. There's a lot more Trek stuff to break down, but before we do, I'm gonna thank the sponsor for this video, Babbel. You know, we're not lucky enough yet to have the universal translator that's been standard issue aboard the USS Enterprise for decades now, but that doesn't mean that a language barrier should stand in the way of a cultural exchange. Whether you're an experienced traveler or traveling abroad for the first time, communication is key to fully experiencing a new culture, and that's where Babbel comes in. Babbel is the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions thanks to Babbel's addictively fun and easy bite-sized language lessons. There's still time to learn a language before you explore a new frontier. I proactively started going back over my Spanish lessons, and it's like riding a bike. Babbel makes it so easy, it's almost like I never stopped studying. Their expertly crafted lessons are built around real life, so you can learn how to have practical conversations, and unlike other language learning apps that use AI for their lesson plans, Babbel lessons were created by over 150 language experts. With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, plus their speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and accent. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel, and right now you can get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash Dan. That's Babbel, B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash Dan for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. I've missed you, Imzadi. Imzad, I should have taught you another word. One of the things I did in another life was I I basically asked permission to write the honest trailer at Screen Junkies for Star Trek The Next Generation. I was basically like, just let me go do it. And I did it. And one thing that one beat that I wrote into the trailer was uh, Troy, her empathic abilities on the show were often there so that she wouldn't have them. It was basically an obstacle like, oh, well, Deanna can't use her abilities. So, you know, that's the show kind of like Worf. Worf is strong so that the other characters can show how much stronger they are. They could beat Worf. I don't sense anything. Not out there. Not in here. In this season, her abilities are crucial. It, yeah. It's the breakthrough with, with Jack to get to the Borg. It's how she finds the crew on the cube. And also uh, correcting a little bit of this, uh, I think, unfair thing that she crashes the ship every time you know that yeah. she, you know she, she's but she's she's at the helm she's helping to get every everybody there yeah. um 
was there a little redemption for Troy that you were kind of aiming for with the season? I I think so. Um, It kind of worked out perfectly. So um, when we made the deals, one of the things they said is like, you can't have Marina until the end because of her schedule in London. And at first I was like, damn. And then I was like, oh, well, you know what we can do is we can see her early on. We can, we can see her on view screens and things, keep her alive. But it's actually good for the story because she would be able to get into Jack's head and figure out the puzzle right away. So why don't we make her the one who is able to get in there and sort it out? So we'll be building to that moment. And then once we get to the big next gen movie in nine and 10, we had all sorts of things for her to do. And then that last moment is the, is she saves the day with the, she's able to find them with the Imzadi moment with, um, you know, and that's, that's my favorite moment in the, in the finale. The finale, obviously we have the Borg. I mean, this, again, we've been building up from, from TNG to first contact. It's this, it's this escalation of this conflict there. I was listening to an interview with James Cameron where he was talking about how he writes and he was talking about the Terminator. And he's like, well, I wrote the Terminator because I had this image of a fiery skeleton. And it's like, but I couldn't shoot it in the present or in the future because I didn't have enough money. So, okay. So it's in the present. So he basically reverse engineered and he's like, that, that's what I do. I figure out where I want to go and I write backwards from there. Was the Borg and this final confrontation sort of a writing backwards moment when you're sort of mapping out the season or did it evolve from, natural progressions of these characters you know when you're trying to figure out where it's all going to go it was organic in the way of once it was about a son then the next question is all right what what how do we put it that relationship through the ringer right then it becomes well what do we pass on what's the story of legacy and then it became what's the very worst thing jean-luc picard would ever want to watch his son go through lacutus became the answer I asked myself, I'm like, well, what if he had inadvertently passed on Locutus to his son in some way and his son was being hunted? Something I passed on to you, one that took a generation to grow. Actually, one of the first people I pitched it to is Jonathan Frakes. I went down to his office. I was like, can I just spin something at you? <laughs> and he, he gasped. He goes, that's so cool. He's like, he's like, so he's like, he's essentially the MacGuffin of the season. I go, yes, he's the, but also the emotional core of it is, is this mystery and the rest fell into place from there. You know, some, I'm, some fans would, would have preferred the, that it would be, you know, the founders and changelings had just stayed through all the way through, but it also felt like you want to end with your top rival, right? I mean, Batman's right. got to face the Joker. Kirk's got to face the Klingons. Sherlock Holmes has got to face Moriarty. Like he ha- he has to face off against this thing in a new way. You got to face the beginning in some way. Although I I do want to give full credit to Amanda Plummer, who I thought was absolutely uh, so yes. good. He's to play understanding ah. to your crew. I'm bored already. We knew we wanted a larger than life Star Trek villain role, and that like Stashwick. We're like, who could that be? Uh, and Amanda Plummer was was if the first name I think I, I, I spit out and called casting. I was like, would she even be interested? And they're like, she totally would be interested. I love that she's the, I think the only character consistently who pronounces Picard. Picard's name French, yeah. which I think was yeah. just such a great little thing, kind of a mocking thing, but also sort of like, what's well, that? she relishes she's it. Yeah, yeah. The next ill-defined unshapen one of you that tells me they've yet to locate picard Mm-mm-mm. red letter media is another person that's made uh uh videos and they made a video about this season they loved it i mean the the turnaround on the show from them i never thought i i mean it's just like a big sloppy wet french kiss um but i don't know if, if you've seen this but they had a theory i saw the plate, I saw the plate. The plate. it's hilarious I, I did see that which one the, oh, the well, plate thing. Well, the, plate, yeah, the thing okay, that cracked me up was their theory that this was uh, Riker fan fiction. You know what happened? Uh, uh, he got to see the two women in his life that gave him the most uh, back talk die on the view screen. 
Roe and Shelby. It's funny. I I don't. Uh, I never got a sense that Shelby is dead. Like she like. I, I I don't know that those are set necessarily to kill. She's got a couple of burns in her, but but uh. But yeah, I saw a lot of that. They fridged Shelby. I was like, well, I guess it's supposed to be jarring, but you. But yeah, I I understand. I understand the the, the criticism. Um, I I feel like Shelby's probably okay. Um, and, and if you were ever to come back, probably she'll be more than five. But um, uh, no, it's not. It's not Riker fan fiction. But that's that's <laughs> hilarious. I actually was reading it's the previous interviews you did that you kind of tried to keep a back door open for Roe, and it's just as you said, there's yeah, only so much time that you've got. You know, you can only yeah. have so much time. Well, I mean, time. if you look at it, um, the calm chirps off a good like six seconds, um, before um the ship blows up and the idea is that the um it was more about framing them for the death uh and that they would there was a scene in which um picard and seven uh found tuvok and her in um on the intrepid with mm -hmm. some other with all the other um uh, starfleet officers that were dopped doppelgangered if you will and um and there was this nice reunion. In fact, I found I found the script pages for it. There was even there was even a pass of the scene where Roe was part of the um, promotion to Seven of Nine, and was in that scene as well. We actually had a whole opening sequence of um, Seven and Rafi in the finale, gathering all those people um, to retake the bridge. All like the cook, the the such and such, the plan. Um, there was a whole different opening um, that we had that also had to go through production. One thing that luckily did make the cut uh, and was huge was the Enterprise D. Um, yes. You know, yeah, we, I, uh, I would... we held on to that with my dying hands. Okay. First of all, I, I was going to ask you this next, but first of all, any other show that would have been in the first trailer, in the second trailer on the poster in every single advertisement, because obviously from a marketing gimmick, if you're trying to get people to watch the easiest way to get people excited about the show is to be like, we're bringing back the enterprise D. Yeah. But right. I think dramatically it's so much more impactful to get to the end of episode nine, not knowing quite where they're going to go. And then you make that big reveal. How, how, how did you who who did how did you convince? Because I'm sure every marketing person at it, it, that's on the pay, payroll at Paramount was like, "Well, I'm telling you how we're selling the show. We're we're doing the Enterprise D. It's on the poster." Like, how did how did I don't I don't understand how it works in today's I, world. I will I neither happen. confirm nor deny that those <laughs> conversations happened often in the beginning as well. But they were very collaborative and more obviously clearly because it didn't happen. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, look, I mean, that was, um, and I actually have to say, uh, Paramount marketing was probably the most collaborative I have ever seen a studio and marketing department ever be. Um, they were, let me be a part of the key art in really wonderful ways. Um. They let us cut the trailers, be part of cutting the trailers. My, our editors do it. Um, that's rare, very rare. So I'm actually forever in their debt for 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 letting the showrunner be 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 such a part of it. Um, but it was a hell of a secret to to keep. I was so grateful when that was out. I was just like, oh, just, let, <laughs> just let it go. We had so many leaks. Lavar had brought it up accidentally at a convention um uh patrick had talked about it once uh we just were just running around covering it up <laughs> like crazy i was trying to figure out because i got very emotional when i saw that very emotional and i was trying to even figure out it's like data i was like analyzing my own emotions i'm like why am i why do i feel this way and it for it's me, shameless it's like, nostalgia bait. That's all. It's just it's empty. But it's not. It's not. I'll let you, I'll you. Bait. It's not nostalgia bait. It's because a, it's it is set up when you go back and watch. It is set up from the from the first time we visit with Jordy. What about Hangar Bay Twelve? 
Andrew, please. Jordy. First of all, there's a practical explanation for how it happened. There's a practical need for it to happen. Are you certain she's not connected to the Starfleet mainframe? I'm positive. You're looking at the last functional ship in the fleet not tied to the system. And I and I think the thing that got me so emotional was it's something that when I, when I said it to myself, I never thought I could see that again. I did not think it was practically possible unless you, unless they fly the Titan backwards around the sun and you emerge back in right. season seven. Like, it's like, that can never happen. It's gone. And yet right. I, that's, I have to give you guys kudos because you figured out a way to do it where it, it didn't come off as cheap nostalgia bait because it, it easily could have. And, and it right. didn't, I, at least. I'm with, no, I'm just being, I'm just being, um, <laughs> For my, you know, some of the most cynical de detractors of the show will call it that. I mean, have called sure. it that, and been like, nah, nah, nah. and I think that's a, it is a unromantic way of looking at it in in every way. Um, and here's why: the Enterprise is a character in the show. It is. If you're doing, if you're reuniting these characters, the Enterprise is a character. Which Enterprise is the question? We could have done the E. We could have done the F, which would have been meaningful to to some game players, but certainly not to this cast. Mm -hmm. But what had been meaningful to this cast was that ship, right? That's where we went. It was it would it was a ship that would have the most emotional impact. It's going back to the beginning, facing the villain from the beginning, which is about his son, right? It, it, and so it it worked for us. And it was it was a hell of a thing to pull off too because we had to start building the second second we we had to tear the chateau down and and we were literally still gluing on the carpet as you know the <laughs> cast was walking in so uh it was uh and everybody was like you can't we're not going to be able to do this don't do this don't do this i'm like we have to do it it's the end of the movie computer initiate shutdown sequence shutdown procedure initiated I miss that voice. I'm glad that it worked for you because that that's how we feel about it as well. I, I know how movies work and the practicalities of it and space, it's not outer space, but actual physical space. Do you know, like, did they did they have the presence of mind to save it this time? It, is the, is, that it is it has, that, that it has absolutely been saved, yeah. That's good. Because you know, most people I think think that, you know. If they go to Warner Brothers, like every set from every movie is still there. Like, oh, yeah, let's go walk over into this. It's like, no, sadly, most of the movie locations that you know and love are destroyed within yeah. days of finishing the shooting. But no, uh, no, that's nice we, to know we, it's been preserved. It, that one we, is is saved. Uh, you know what, what its fate is. Who knows? But that one was that that one was saved. We are the crew of the USS Enterprise. But more than that. We're your family. Q comes back and again you it's I've always said like it's not necessarily especially in sci-fi it's not what you do it's just if you explain it and it's explained very easily why Q's there he's like do you thinking so linearly it's like yeah of course because Q can do whatever he wants I thought you were dead uh oh and here I was hoping the next generation wouldn't think so linearly again nerdy question his uniform or his whatever his he's wearing. Uh, yeah. Very kind of a TOS feel, I thought. Uh, TOS. Almost like, it also like, nods back to um, Encounter at Farpoint as judges look yeah. a little bit too. Almost like a little Trelane-ish, which everyone's always like, is Trelane a part of the Q collection? Got a little bit but, of that in there as well, yeah. Michael Crow um, was brilliant. Our, our, our wardrobe designer, yeah. I know that you'd said that you, know, you and John Delancey had kind of, that he was very eager to have the chance to keep playing Q and I mean I think that's one of the great things about that character is you don't have to retcon his death it's just that he's omnipotent he can go anywhere anytime yeah he's a choose your own adventure he can bounce around his book whenever he wants to time wise yeah. at any point it's not living linearly you told my father that humanity's trial was over it is for him but I'm here today because of you. Like we were saying, you make this in a vacuum, especially because you're back to back with season two. So they shoot season two. Season two comes out after you've shot this season. Yeah. You're working on it. Uh, like, you know, you I'm sure you probably finished this season even a little bit ahead of when it premieres because there's going to be a gap between the two. It comes out. And I mean, the response to this has been insane. Uh, like, I mean, the, it seems like everybody 
regardless whether they love the first two seasons, whether they didn't love the first two seasons, whether they were TNG, TOS, DS9, Vo- there's a little bit of every single phase of Trek, every iteration of Trek in the season. And it seems like everybody is so on board with it. I mean, how that culmination, how does, how does it feel for it to be out and for you to see that there are so many people that are just loving what everybody works so hard to achieve? I mean, it's, it's well, not, I wouldn't say everybody, but I, w- I would say it, it is uh, a good swath of, of, of fans are, it, it is, uh, we won the crowd um, and it, and it feels, and it feels really, really, uh, uh, feels really, really good. It's overwhelming. It's also a little bit like a weird dream state. Like, is it, did it happen? Did any of that really happen? Was that, do I go Back to writing cop dramas. What do I do now? I will say I had, a, you know, an incredible meeting the other day, non trek related. That was like the most incredible meeting of my professional career. That was not that. And they were talking about all, all they wanted to do was talk about this, and all I wanted to do was talk about their thing. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, 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 we'll talk about like no, no, no. But I, I'm and they're like, and, and it was um. And that's new, you know what I mean? Um, and yeah. uh, I had never experienced that before. Um, I don't know, it, it, it's it's surreal. It, it really is surreal. I can tell you that it was seeing it on the big screen in the IMAX theater when we did that screening in two hours, felt like the movie experience I had always wanted. The, we set out to make the two hour next gen movie and I was sitting next to Brent Spiner and Jonathan Frakes and 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 my best friend from New Jersey was with me who uh, uh, I watched all good things with and he leaned over halfway through and he's like I cannot even believe we're here doing this now. <laughs> and that was worth it you know what I mean like that was so it, it it's been a hell of a ride I have no idea what comes next um but uh, and again, I'm I'm here because, you know, Alex and Akiva and Paramount gave me this crazy opportunity, and Patrick allowed us to do all these things, and I had an incredible writing staff and team, and Dave Blast and these composers and posts and visual effects. Like the, it was an it was a huge, huge ensemble of people who were able to put this together. So, um, I'm grateful for all of them. Well, I know that there's a lot of fan uh, support out there for Star Trek Legacy, which, uh, you know, yeah. that's uh, that's the the, the 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 dream, perhaps, of what's next. And let's say, you know, la- before I let you go, let's say last, you know, you get a, a call today, tomorrow, saying we're greenlighting Star Trek Legacy. What do you think your aim or your goal would be? Would it just be to just continue on the legacy or uh, as is the name of the show? Or is it just too early to even think about something like that? Oh, um. I mean, no, I know exactly what it is. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it's it, it's 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 too dreamy to talk about. I mean, it's it's Star Trek: The Next Generation is is what it is. It's, it, it, the torch has been passed, but um, but how great is it to also incorporate the previous generation, you know, and mm-hmm. and, and keep those characters a part of it as well. Um, it's a little bit, uh, of the week. It's also a little bit serialized. It's what else is going out there? What's the Klingon empire up to, you know, um, oh man, there's so many good ideas, there's, um, <laughs> you know, but, um, again, it's, uh, it's up to the television gods, you know? So, right. Well, I certainly, regardless, I really enjoyed this season. Thank you from the TNG fans heart uh, for making this. You know, I'm a fan of your work, so it's, it's the greatest thing to be here. So thank you. Well, I appreciate it. And thank you for being so generous uh, with your time. Terry Metalis, everybody. One of my favorite seasons of Star Trek ever. Oh, thank you, man.
Thanks so much to Terry for being so generous with his time and sharing so much great information about Star Trek Picard Season 3. As you can tell, probably because I was geeking out over that entire season, it really, really was something special and delivered so much from such a, a really heartfelt and genuine place of love for this franchise and for the fans of the franchise and for these characters. There are many, many ways that shows like this and movies like this have gone wrong, and it's usually because there is some sort of a cynicism behind the making of it, and there was absolutely none of that with this season. I will be re-watching Star Trek Picard Season 3 many times over, and honestly, I think Star Trek Legacy, in my opinion, should have been greenlit yesterday because I want to see that show now so much. It is the Star Trek show that I would watch a thousand times if it were on tomorrow, and I think that if Terry's brought over to run that show, we know that the Star Trek Legacy is in great hands. So, once again, thank you so much to Terry. Thank you to Babel, who sponsored this video. And thank you for hanging around and watching this nerdy Star Trek chat. Don't forget to stay tuned here on the channel for more movie news, reviews, box office, streaming, and more. Until then, stay safe and live long and prosper.